Anthony Bourdain loves to say he has the best job in the world. With all the fun I had this summer, I'd have to disagree. Bouncing around the country and shooting with people who are at the top of their game is by far the most fun I've had. But this ride is bigger than me having fun. It's the symbolic and literal foundation of this country and the inherent right of self-preservation. Yeah. So upon my arrival back to Dallas, I put out a post on social media for a meetup to have a conversation about what we're gonna do to defend the Second Amendment. I think for, for me, it was, it was realizing that it's, it's so much more than just a tool for hunting. Having a firearm isn't just about putting antlers on the wall. It's a, it can be about self-defense. I didn't like feeling vulnerable. I've never been someone that's weak or scared. Growing up on a dairy farm, dad raised me to take care of myself. And I realized, well, I, um, I have band-aids in my purse. If anybody gets cut, I have fire extinguisher, but I didn't have any way to protect myself. A gun is a tool. There are other things out there that you can actually use to protect yourself. But having that force equalizer, having a gun is great. You have to be your first responder. You have to actually take responsibility in for protecting your life. And the only way to do that is by training, going out there seeking that knowledge. Coming from the UK and South Africa, I've seen how people do not care if they don't have a stake. Get as many people educated, get them into guns, we have a lot more supporters. So how do we as a community talk to people in such a way where, yeah, sure, the gun is there to protect you. That, that is a large part of it. But how do we impart what we get out of firearms to the rest of the world? I actually had the pleasure of teaching two turbo liberals how to shoot. And their thing was, why do I need a gun? Because the cops have guns. You only need a gun if bad things are going to happen. So if you don't have a gun, then bad things will happen. happen. Something goes wrong, you call the cops. So I was like, okay, we're sitting here, we're in this building, it's after hours, we're the only two people here. Somebody comes in that door right now and decides that they want to kill both of us. Would you rather me have my phone or a gun? And you can see it, it goes off. You can see it in their eyes. Because what you've done, you've taken and you put them in the, you put them in the situation. And there's no denying the reality of that situation. My sincere thanks to all of you for coming out and sharing your stories and opinions. You all had a ton of awesome things to say, but we didn't have time to show everything. Welcome to my world. But just showing up and sharing your appreciation for firearms and your passion for defending them was a show of power. As long as gun owners follow your lead and go beyond their everyday jobs and obligations and hunts and range time to speak out for this right, no one will ever be able to take it away from us. As a fellow gun owner, as an American, as someone who wants to raise a family and be free to defend them, someday, thank you. Meet Gabby Franco. If you haven't already, you might have seen her competing on Top Shot, or shooting pistols in the Olympics, or fighting for the Second Amendment as my fellow commentator on NRA News. She was born in Venezuela and knows what it's like to watch your freedoms disappear. She's a powerful advocate for our cause and a hell of a good shot. We're gonna grab the kettlebells and then we're gonna run 60 yards. Okay. You're gonna drop the kettlebells and run back 60 yards. And then we're gonna use this uneven platform to shoot. Your gun is gonna be unloaded. Magazine's gonna be on the barrel. Once you're ready, get on it and two shots on each target. On your mark, get set, go.
I couldn't help think of a, a situation where like somebody were trying to attack you in some respect and them being surprised by how well you can handle yourself because you had a firearm and you know how to use it well. That is the equalizer against a person like, anybody can be bigger than me, yeah, let's be yeah, realistic. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, were yeah, too yeah. nice yeah. to say that I'm relatively small. I mean, I'm short small. too, so you know, <laughs> I, we, we play on the same playing field, yeah. right? We're like, <laughs> so I think it's all about getting to know that I'm ready to fight. Yeah. Back in Venezuela, in the university, uh, I took the easy way, which was the wrong one because the avenue was in construction, so it was empty. As I'm walking, I'm listening to music, I saw a guy, he passed me, and then this guy hugged me, and he had his hand like this, and he said, if you scream, I'll kill you. I was 19 at the time. I was actually to go to the Olympic Games. I was already... So you were already a shooter. I was, I was a shooter, yeah. but as an Olympic shooter, right? I knew what a firearm in my head looked like. Yeah. So I said, you have no gun. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to have a thick leather notebook and I just tossed the notebook to him. He tried to grab me and then I started screaming and running for my life. Yeah. And um, I don't, right now, I have my concealing carry, and I wouldn't think twice. I didn't have it at that time because I couldn't, but you know, it's all about protecting your life, protecting your family. It's the same thing that I, I try to communicate to a lot of people that ask me, why do you carry a gun, why do you carry a gun? It's because I, I love my life, I enjoy my life, I love the people in my life, and I want to protect it the best way I can. Knowing that there are great people around yeah. us, yeah. But there's also bad people, they don't care about me. Yeah. They don't care about you. They don't care about my family. But people don't realize here that everything, government tried to take a little bit and a little bit at yeah. a time, yeah. and then what happens? Yeah. Then you have nothing. Then you have nothing. And friends and family would say, no, that would never happen in Venezuela. Mm. That would never happen here. And boom. It sure did. It did. So we can't take our rights for granted, ever. I don't care where you are in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Grab them, protect them, and fight for them. Absolutely. Welcome, citizen, to a better world, a safer world, a world where you have nothing to hide and nothing to fear. What are you trying to protect yourself from? Osama bin Laden is not coming into your house with AK-47. So what you're telling me is we need to restrict their ability to use the most effective form to protect themselves because to you it seems silly because you live in downtown Dallas in a high rise. And the fact that you aren't afraid to admit, I listen to Drake, I like guns, I like the things that I like and I'm not gonna apologize for it the same way that Candace and I are gonna love each other. We're gonna be Christians and we're gonna like guns and we're not going to feel like we have to be in a cocoon of liberal life. Now it's like, it's more, I've watched this gangster movie and I know now that I have this gun, if he says anything to me, my first option might be, I'm showing my gun. You know, I think we need a better understanding of reality. When somebody dies, it's not a movie, they don't come back. So you're saying that because the genie's out of the bottle, we can't put it back in, so we, we should have guns everywhere to keep ourselves safe. We never could put it back in. It can be put back in. It happened in Australia. I promise you, if somebody walked into the building right now and started shooting, the last thing you're gonna think is to grab your phone to call the cops. Anti-gunners love to say there's at most a 1% chance you'll ever need a gun. My response is always, what would you say to the 1% who had their gun when they needed it? And what about the 1% who did it? Meet Danny and Spencer, two normal guys living in Dallas, and two guys who might not be here today if it weren't for their firearms. We walked right out of those doors that we just walked out of. And, uh, and I'm kind of glancing around. Everything seems fine, you know? Yeah. We, we start heading to my car. It's parked right where I'm parked tonight. I pull out. Apparently, I cut this guy off. And when he came around, he kind of brake checked me once or twice and thought that was weird, gave him a little space as he goes up the hill. And I get to about right here, and I start reaching out to open the door. And I realize that my son is standing right over there on the sidewalk, and he's got a Glock 26 drawn. He kind of turns a little bit, blocks the single lane. I'm thinking, that's strange. But I was already in the process of opening the door. Lights came on in the car, and there's this guy laying 
in the floorboard of the car right there with a knife. So he stops. I'm two, three car lengths behind him. That's when I see him. He's aggravated. He gets out of his car. My son was on the phone with police, giving him a clear description of what was going on. Immediately, that's a red flag for me. So I pop my glove box open where I keep my 45. I tell the guy, I'm like, you know, shut your mouth, get your hands up, don't move your hands. And then I see him open the back door of his car, and I see a baseball bat come out, and that's, that's a shit hits the fan situation for me. So I did immediately draw the weapon. All of a sudden, you know, I hear, woo, 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 just super fast coming the wrong way down the street. And I'm thinking, and I'm looking over, cops have their guns drawn this way. Dallas Police Department, I'm coming up behind you. And, and I'm like, and all of a sudden, I feel a hand on my shoulder, and he says, step to the side. And so I, I step to the side, and he said, I got this. He says, you OK? I said, I'm fine. He goes, go ahead and reholster. And I was like, this is cool. You know, <laughs> so I just kind of reholstered, and they, they drug him out and arrested him. As soon as he saw me drawing up, that's when he backed off through the baseball bat and then drove off. And for me, that was, it was an intense situation. It's the first time I've had to draw my weapon in any sort of real life scenario. But luckily, you know, I mean, the situation was resolved without, you know, in my opinion, without any violence. How do we account for the violence that's out there? What's perpetuating this then? Because if, if, it's all, if it's all of these good people with guns that aren't committing any violence, why do we still have the level of violence that we have? We can't have a real conversation about violence because you put the word gun in front of you. Mm -hmm. Violence is violence. And a lot of times, you know, violence is the answer. I mean, there's, there's people that you can't negotiate with. There's people that you're gonna have to defend yourself from. Am I willing to give up my personal freedoms? For peace? No, I'm not. Why not? Uh, because my, my life is very peaceful, and I take those personal responsibilities to, to make sure of that. The people that are against guns, they don't want that responsibility. They don't want the responsibility of taking up a gun and carrying it every day. They don't want the responsibility of saying, you know what, if I'm attacked, I have to fight for my life. It's the burden of carrying a weapon. I mean, you literally, like you said, it, it's a burden. Yeah. In both of our cases, we didn't have to discharge our weapons. We were able to dissolve the situation without violence. Yes, there was an inanimate object there that was able to kill that person, but we didn't. So here we are, the end of season three. However, not the end of my journey. Outside the gun community, the conversation about guns isn't a conversation at all. It's a propaganda entertainment fest, a cesspool of agenda-driven, politicized nonsense built for controversy and TV ratings. In season four, I go out into the real world, filled with real people and real opinions, having very real conversations about the future of the freedom I so cherish. It shouldn't get to the point where, in order for you to, one, protect yourself, that you become a victim. It's very important. We already have that right. Take advantage of it. It's not just, you know, evil guns. It, it's, a, it's a sport. It's a lifestyle. Make sure we talk to everybody about it. You know, it's, it's got to be an all-inclusive issue. You know, really relate to everyone that it's not something to take away. It's very unique to the United States.